Welcome, I am Emir, and let's look back in hindsight. This video is part of a long series. Bitin Serie, Fair Use Saga, Linux Mint Saga. To watch the full video, click the link on the end screen. Or in the description. Thank you. <coughs> Chapter 1 Detour and Tradition. Welcome, I am Emir, and let's look back in hindsight. Linux Mint is an Ubuntu based Linux distro. <coughs> GNU Linux Distro. But, it did not start that way. This long, your history lesson began with 1.0 ADA. ADA, not ADA. Because, Pinoy ako, Pinoy tayo. Released on 27 August 2006, ADA was based on Kubuntu 6.06. .06. Still Ubuntu, I guess, since Kubuntu is a flavor of Ubuntu. Ubuntuception. Or is it Ubuntuception? English. Unlike Kubuntu, ADA came with multimedia support out of the box. Mint's selling point from the start was that it included Flash, Java, Real Player, Codex, and encrypted. DVD support. Distros like Ubuntu that followed free software philosophies. Yes, I said it in the past tense, followed. Did not. Anyone burnt out from Windows with the reset drama? Vista didn't even RTM yet. Whose fault was that? Could easily jump ship. The Mint team had ease of use. No. Comfort. In mind. With multimedia support. But. Not everything is smooth sailing. Ada came with a homemade installer that is not convivial. I don't know what convivial means in the Linux world. Though, if we follow the dictionary definition of convivial, I couldn't agree more. The live CD did not have a partition maker. So I had to first boot to 2.0 Barbara. Spoilers, I guess. And make partitions from there. It was a pain in the neck getting the mouse to go where you want it to go. Tip. Disable mouse integration on virtual box. You know what else is a pain? It was also a pain in the behind making a smooth recording. Screams put me out of my misery. Based on Kubuntu, Ada uses the K desktop environment. KDE 
the pure technology color scheme is Vista-esque, or what the Gen Zs call Frutiger Aero. Brad Merring's photo showing the Peruvian Alpamayo or Alpamayu might even be a nod to Vista's wallpaper. Here are other changes. The office suite in Ada is also different from Vanilla Kubuntu. But that's it. Cosmetic changes overall. The name Linux Mint appears only on the boot screen. This trend would continue with 2.0 Barbara from 13 November 2006, three months after ADA. Barbara is easier to install. This is the real 1.0, the true start of the Linux Mint saga. One, because of a development reset, not the first in Emir's B10, and certainly, it won't be the last. And two, because 1.0 ADA never got a final release. Only a beta, 007. I guess that's better than an alpha. Wait a minute. No one uses alpha and beta anymore. Beta, yes, but not alpha. More than just an experimental Ubuntu reskin with multimedia support, Mint 2.1 Bea dropped on 20 December 2006. Just two and a half weeks after 2.0. Barbara. Bea ship with third party software, not in Barbara. First, notes up Tomboy. No, that's Homeboy. One hundred Filipino Pinoy lost media coming soon. Tomboy was Vista's sticky note sidebar gadget for Linux Mint. But, the notes are on Windows and do not look like sticky notes. So one note, I guess. Second, desktop search app Beagle. Just like WinFS, Beagle was a resource hog. No wonder it did not last. Third, Envy, an installer for NVIDIA drivers, which I can only imagine was a godsend. Fourth and last, the Network Manager applet, which by August 2007, eight months later, Clem was considering replacing with WICD. But it's not just software by others. The long line of Mint tools began in Bea with the homegrown Mint Wi-Fi for installing Wi-Fi drivers without being connected online. 2.1 Bea still looks like 2.0 Barbara, which in turn mirrors Ubuntu 6.10. However, Bea is the start of Mint being an evolutionary rather than revolutionary operating system. After the branding changes on boot, 
Mint Desktop would welcome the user with features that have stood the test of time. Still, on present day Mint. One, bookmarks on the left panel of the Nautilus file manager. Follow the tips or do it the easy way. Drag the folder icon to the panel. 2. Actions on the right click, aka context menu, for opening a folder on terminal and deleting files directly without going to the trash, recycle bin, waste basket. And 3. Home folders. Mint Desktop also contained the computer and home icons until the recent past. Do these features look familiar? Again, besides the multimedia support updates, ease of use, no, comfort. For new Linux users, jumping ship from Windows. Hit pause to read. This comfort philosophy continued in 2.2 Bianca, which went live on 20 February 2007, just two months after Bea. One panel and the Mint menu, Taskbar and Start menu, replaced the GNOME 2 top and bottom panels. This change had nothing to do with Windows. Clem would state in 2010, quote, I don't think Windows deserves to be mentioned when it comes to a traditional desktop layout. Whether it's the early use of the mouse device, the single panel at the bottom, or the items on the desktop, None of these were invented by Microsoft. Popular Linux desktop environments have been using a bottom panel for years. FVWM, KDE, and even early versions of GNOME. End quote. We will get to meet Clem later, but right now, let's talk about why is that legal? Why are desktop environments, graphical user interfaces, GUIs, allowed to copy their homework? Because nothing is original. Nothing comes from nothing. Welcome to the Bitin Serie Fair Use Saga Part of this video. Disclaimer supply. I am a lawyer in the Philippines, not in the USA, USA, USA. But our copyright law was adopted from the United States of America. So I am familiar with the US Copyright Act of 1976 and its history. For info purposes only, not legal advice. This may be a video on Linux Mint, but what would an Emir's Biten retrospective on computers be without Windows? Not that Windows. There we go. Meet Xerox. Yes, that Xerox. Palo Alto Research Center. Xerox Parks. Alto. From 1973. It used a GUI as documented in Nathan Lionback's Toasty. Technology page. Look familiar? 
But if you close your eyes, Xerox Park also made small talk. An object-oriented programming language and environment. According to Ken Sheriff, the small talk environment created the desktop metaphor with icons, scroll bars, overlapping windows, and pop-up menus. Whether or not Apple, then Apple Computer, whether or not Apple's Steve Jobs saw the small talk GUI, and whether or not it inspired him in defining the Apple Lisa's or Macintosh's GUI does not matter. Why? According to the decision of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit, in the case Apple filed against Microsoft and Hewlett Packard Company, HP, spoilers, quote, Apple admits that it borrowed heavily from the iconic treatments in the Xerox Star and an IBM Picture World research report. End quote. Iconic treatments, meaning icons. No Supreme Court decision, the USSC denied Apple's petition for writ of certiorari. For Emir's Bitten viewers, that term, certiorari, should be familiar. Wait a minute. Xerox Star? Not Alto? Let me go back. Paraphrasing another boring topic from the Windows 1.0 documentary, the Alto made real the concepts from the mother of all demos. Pioneering computer researcher Douglas Engelbart's 1968 presentation on human slash computer interaction. But the Alto was not a commercial product. It was expensive and used custom hardware. Enter Xerox Star which could run on any computer. But the star failed. Why? See on screen, prices not adjusted for inflation. Meanwhile, quoting Paul Danish from Club Mac News, November 1984, quote, Indeed, Apple licensed. Licensed. We talked about that before. Star technology for use in Lisa and presumably in Mac. Exactly how much star is in Mac isn't entirely clear. But it is obviously not an insubstantial amount. And good. Per the Ninth Circuit Court decision, quote, and I will keep quoting because it is better to be accurate than to paraphrase, quote, the Lisa desktop and the Macintosh Finder are based on a desktop metaphor with windows, icons, and pull-down menus, which can then be manipulated on the screen with a handheld device called a mouse. End quote. Apple then registered the GUIs of both for copyright as an audiovisual work.
the Lisa Flop. The Macintosh also flop. Surely Edgar was also a flop, too ahead of its time. Microsoft then released Windows 1.0, which also flop. Apple complained to Microsoft because allegedly Windows 1.0 had a similar GUI to the Lisa and Mac. Both then negotiated for a contract. Apple's first draft said, Quote, At no time shall this grant extend to any appearance, look, feel, visual feature or operation other than that incorporated in Microsoft Windows. End quote. Deal or no deal? Microsoft said, no deal. The final draft from Microsoft, which Apple agreed to, reads, as the Ninth Circuit summarized in footnote 8, quote, in the agreement, Microsoft acknowledged, quote, Conception that the visual displays in Windows 1.0 are derivative works. We talked about what derivative works are before. Of the visual displays generated by Apple's Lisa and Macintosh graphical user interface programs. Unquote. Visual displays, whatever that means. Back to footnote 8, quote, Apple granted Microsoft an unexclusive, royalty-free, non-transferable license, quote to use these derivative works in present and future software programs and to license them. End quote to third parties for use in new software programs. Not just Windows 1.0, not just Windows. Microsoft, in turn, granted Apple a similar license, quote to use any new displays created by Microsoft and codeception during the next five years as part of its Windows retail software products. Apple waived any copyright, patent, trade secret, or other claim against Windows 1.0. Microsoft agreed to delay the release of any versions of its Excel spreadsheet program that would run on computers other than the Macintosh. And Microsoft agreed to release an enhanced version of Microsoft Word, a word processing program, for the Macintosh. End quote. This agreement wasn't getting to have cake and eating it too. Instead, it was meeting halfway. 1984 cosplaying as anti-1984 was not satisfied though. Going back to page 2, quote, Microsoft released Windows 2.03 and later Windows 3.0. Its licensee, sublicense, licenseception, Hewlett Packard Company, HP, introduced New Wave 1.0 and later New Wave 3.0, which 
run in conjunction with Windows to make IBM compatible computers easier to use. Apple believed that these versions exceed the license, make Windows more air quotes, Mac like, and infringe its copyright. This action, this case, followed. End quote. The district court, lower court, ruled in Microsoft's and HP's favor in their motions for summary judgment of non infringement. Summary judgment, meaning no trial, no jury. Why the USA, USA, USA uses the jury system but never implemented it in its Asian colony except for procurement is a story for another time. Apple appealed. The district court started with the license, the agreement, to determine what Microsoft was allowed to copy. If copying was allowed, licensed, then there is no copyright infringement. Both the district and the appeals courts construed, interpreted the agreement to cover visual displays, not the Windows 1.0 interface. The next step then was to identify which visual displays of Windows 2.03, 3.0, and New Wave were licensed, and which were not. After that, the court distinguished ideas from expression. Ideas are not copyrightable. Expressions are. But you knew that already. The district court found that the similarities in Windows 2.03 and 3.0 were unprotectable, uncopyrightable, or licensed, permitted elements. Meanwhile, the similarities between protectable elements in Apple's works and HP's new wave were de minimis, minimal or only a handful. What hurdle must Apple meet then? Quote, Thus, any claim of infringement that Apple may have against Microsoft must rest on the copying of Apple's unique selection and arrangement of all of these features. Under Harper House and Fry Barger, previous cases, there can be no infringement unless the works are virtually identical. End quote. Apple argued on appeal that the district court erred in dissecting its works the Lisa and Macintosh GUIs into individual elements and viewing each element in isolation. It insisted that the proper standard to determine copyright infringement was substantial similarity, not virtual identity. Unlike virtual identity, Substantial similarity is less strict. To quote a more recent Second Circuit decision, 
quote, the standard test for substantial similarity between two items is whether an ordinary observer, unless he set out to detect the disparities, would be disposed to overlook them and regard the aesthetic appeal as the same. Meaning, compare the whole look and feel. However, quote, where, as in this case, a work incorporates unprotectable elements from the public domain, we apply a, air quotes, more discerning observer test, which requires, quoteception, substantial similarity between those elements and only those elements that provide copyrightability to the alleged infringed work. End quote. This type of substantial similarity test seems to be similar to the virtual identity standard in the Apple case, except that each element is not viewed in isolation alone. The Ninth Circuit decided, quote, considering the license and the limited number of ways that the basic ideas of the Apple GUI can be expressed differently, we conclude that only, air quotes, thin protection against virtually identical copying is appropriate. Apple's appeal, which depends on comparing its interface as a whole for substantial similarity, must therefore fail. It is not easy to distinguish expression from ideas, particularly in a new medium. However, it must be done, as the district court did in this case. As we recognized long ago in the case of competing jewel B pins, similarities derived from the use of common ideas cannot be protected. Otherwise, the first to come up with an idea will corner the market. Apple cannot get patent-like protection for the idea of a graphical user interface or the idea of a desktop metaphor which concededly came from Xerox. It can and did put those ideas together creatively with animation, overlapping windows, and well-designed icons. But it licensed the visual displays which resulted. The district court found that there are five other basic ideas embodied in the desktop metaphor. Use of windows to display multiple images on the computer screen, and to facilitate user interaction with the information contained in the windows. Iconic representation of familiar objects from the office environment. Manipulation of icons to convey instructions and to control operation of the computer. Use of menus to store information or computer functions in a place that is convenient to reach, but saves screen space for other images. And opening and closing of objects as a means of retrieving, transferring, and storing information. 
no copyright protection in years in these ideas. Therefore, substantial similarity of expression in unlicensed elements cannot be based on the fact that the LISA, the Finder, Windows 2.03, 3.0, and New Wave all have windows, icons representing familiar objects in the office environment that describe functions being performed, and that can be moved around the screen to tell the computer what to do. Menus, which give easy access to information or functions, without using space on the screen or objects that open and close and code. Therefore, the Ninth Circuit, the Appeals Court, ruled that the District Court's step-by-step -step analysis was correct. Apple did not question on appeal if the trial court correctly applied the virtual identity standard. So it was the end of the line. It lost. Imagine a world without this Ninth Circuit decision. What would GUIs, what would desktop environments look like? We would have gotten GNOME 3 or Windows 8, Neptune, as early as the 1980s. Just to avoid copyright infringement lawsuits from the fruit company. 2.2 Bianca's GUI looked less like Ubuntu at that time. And more like, well, modern-day Linux Mint Mate. But hey, I'm getting ahead of myself. Unlike 2.1 Beas Blue and Ubuntu Color Scheme, 2.2 Bianca sported a green theme and new icons. Ease of use. No comfort. By adopters coming from Windows, continued to be the main focus. Mint Disk allowed read-write access of FAT32 and NTFS drives from Windows. Mint Disk was from 2007. Meanwhile, vanilla Windows 11 still cannot read and write on X4 drives. EXT4 drives from Linux. Microsoft has other priorities. Mint Desktop could mount Windows Network neighborhoods, aka automatic browsing of a Windows network, which I'll explain in my video about Active Directory. I'll get to that someday, I guess. Subscribe. Last is Mint Config for settings. Since GNOME then did not have a control panel. Bianca would also be the true successor to 1.0 ADA Beta 7. Through the Bianca KDE Edition, which was a reskin and nothing more. The promise was that Mint tools would progressively be ported to KDE. There was also a mini KDE version that could fit in a CD. Bianca was the first to have a light edition. 
unlike the main edition. Light did not have what made Linux Mint. Well, Linux Mint. What are software patents? And why are they bad? Stay tuned to find out. The 2.0 Barbara to 2.2 Bianca release notes hinted at a little surprise inside the terminal. Command prompt. Humorous quotes. And later, fortunes. Until they were lost in the Gnome Tree Apocalypse. Can Mint bring fortunes back? Let me know what you thought of this video. Comment below. Please like and share this video on social media. Subscribe and ring the bell. Watch all Emir's B10. Balik tanaw slash in hindsight. Support the show on Patreon, on PayPal, or through crypto. Thank you to my sibling, G-G Arts for my avatar. Check out and support her work by clicking the links in the description. To watch the full video, the link should come up here on the end screen. Now. Thanks for watching. Stay safe and take care.